he called the children of Israel together to review their history, to uh, reinforce some lessons that they had learned and perhaps make lessons of the experiences they'd had. And he wasn't the first one to do this. Moses did the same thing in the book of Deuteronomy. And as Bonnie and I are about to leave, uh, I'd like to uh, reiterate some of the things I've said before. And I hope uh, lessons can be learned by all. I see we have a lot of visitors, but the lessons are universal. We're all human. We're all subject to similar temptations. Lately, I've been... uh, doing a survey, a survey of the New Testament. In talking with non-Adventists and also in Adventist circles, sometimes the question of obedience to God is in question. And so I came up with four different things that I was looking for as I went through the New Testament. Uh, I was looking at commandments, references to God's commandments, God's grace, His salvation, and obedience. And I wanted to see what kind of proportion there was between references to these topics. And for commandments, you know, the, the commandments are referred to a lot of times indirectly. Like when they talk about judgment, surely there's a standard to judge by. And so God's law has to be it. When they talk about grace, looking up the uh, definition in Strong's dictionary, it has to do with the Holy Spirit and it's its influence and its effect in our life. In other words, what happens because of the Holy Spirit. And so, looking for references to grace, I threw in the healings of Jesus. He had a definite effect in their lives. And the word obedience isn't always used as many times as it's referred to. We're told to abide in Christ or walk this way, continue in the things that you've learned. All of these are references to obedience. And I have a tally here. I can give you some numbers. Now these numbers are kind of subjective. You can probably go through and come up with different numbers, but I think the proportions will be similar. In the Gospels, where Jesus is the predominant person, the commandments are referred to 87 times. Grace, 148 times. There was a lot of healing going on. Physical and spiritual. Salvation mentioned 82 times and obedience, 102. Now, John tells us that that the law came by Moses, but salvation and grace came by Jesus Christ. And I see all of them referred to in the New Testament. The commandments and obedience are not downplayed. In the whole New Testament, references to the commandments, I came up with 475. In no way is God's law downplayed. References to grace, 286 times. References to salvation, 240 times. And obedience, 299. So the New Testament in no way does away with the Old Testament and the law which is proclaimed in it. 
it's even a more concentrated focus on it on, on, and on what's acceptable to God. Now that I've given you the numbers, I'll put them aside and get on with the sermon. But they do have a reference or a, a relevance to what I'll be talking about. Looking at 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, we'll start there. The Apostle John, when he was an old man, he was giving guidance to the church, churches he was about to leave. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So righteousness is right doing, doing what's right. And of course, we want to do what's right in God's eyes. And he's told us what's right. And I'll just refer to Romans 2.13. It says, not the hearers, but the doers of the law are justified. You know, we can come and listen to a lot of good sermons, and there are certainly some impressive preachers. Just love to listen to them. But if they tell us things, and then we go away after the sermon, and there's no change in our life, what good does it do? Not the hearers, but the doers of the law are justified. And in Acts 5.32, we're told that the Holy Ghost is given to them who are obedient. Are we all obedient to all the good we know to do? How much of the Holy Ghost do you want in your life? We're told to pray for the Holy Ghost, but before we pray for that Holy Ghost, we need to pray that we'll be ready for the Holy Ghost. And that very prayer is the evidence of Him working in your lives. Yeah. In John 16, we're told that when He comes, He brings conviction of sin. The carnal man doesn't like to be told he's not right, but that's one of the first things the Holy Ghost does. And it's for a good cause. It's for a good reason. James 1.22 talks about it's the doers, not the hearers only. Or, or he encourages us to be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. In other words, if we enjoy listening to a good sermon and revel in the truth and the light, but we're not willing to live up to it, we're deceiving ourselves. We think we love the truth, but we're not applying it to our lives. Back to 1 John chapter 4. Verses uh, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In that survey, the commandments were very prominent. And those commandments are an expression of God's love. God is love. They're an expression of his character. Yes. And that's the kind of character we want to have. Yes. To where we wouldn't do those things that God wouldn't do. And in John thirteen thirty four, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that ye love one another. Yes. The Jews were into the law. They knew all about the law, especially the Pharisees. But he gave him a new commandment. Yes. But it wasn't a new commandment because the law itself is an expression of love. Yes. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. It's called the love chapter. And 
It follows after 1 Corinthians 12, which talks about the spiritual gifts, and we're told to desire the best gifts. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, we're told that, you know, all these gifts can pass away. Our, we can understand Scripture very well. And we can understand the prophecies to explain them to anyone. And yet, if we don't have love, it doesn't profit us, any, us anything. Yes. If we don't have God's character, if we don't have Christ living in us, yes. there's, there's no profit to us. It's just a head trip. Yes. And while we're here, let's look at God's love a little bit in verse 5. The last phrase... I want to focus on. It says, thinketh no evil. Love thinketh no evil. If you see someone doing something which could be construed as being wrong, the loving thing to do is to put a good construction on it. Oh, surely they wouldn't do wrong. But is that being enabling to them to doing wrong? You know, if they continue doing things which look like they're wrong, maybe something else needs to come into play. 1 John 5, 2 and 3 tells us that we know that we love God's children because we love God and keep His commandments. In other words, if we really have God's love in us and we keep His commandments, we also love everyone else. We are living that godly expression or life of love. Isaiah 58 talks about a fast that God has chosen to undo the burdens, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked. And as we do these things, these are acts of love which God wants expressed to the world. As we do these things, then our health will improve. And we shall rise up with wings as an eagle. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6. Our song was about love at home, but how big is your home? How big is your family? Is this a church family? Shouldn't we have love in the family? Galatians 6.10 As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. We're supposed to love everyone, but especially our church family. We should be bound together with those ties of love. Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. I hope some of you are provoked today in a good way. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as the day approaches. So we're to provoke each other and exhort each other. Leviticus 19.17 says we're to rebuke each other when we see each other doing something wrong and not allow the person to continue doing what's wrong. And so 1 Corinthians 13 says we're to think no evil and yet when it becomes obvious that there may be some evil, we need to speak to it. And then I think of the children of Israel when they uh, had conquered the promised land. The two and a half tribes crossed back over the Jordan and they built an altar. It was, to them, it was to be a reminder. But to the tribes on the other side of the river, they said, hey, they're supposed to worship here and here they are building 
their own religious system up over there. And so they got their armies together and they went to straighten them out. Sister White, in speaking on this, says they should have made courteous inquiry first. Because when they got there and they heard the reason, they said, that's all right, praise the Lord. Courteous inquiry. In other words, we may see something that we think is wrong, but before we confirm it in our minds, we should go to the horse's mouth. First Thessalonians five. Starting at 14, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Again, especially among ourselves. And as I've mentioned, you know, if we see something we think is wrong, we need, to, we need to address it. Not to everyone else, but to the person. Matthew 18 talks about bringing it to everyone else if the person doesn't respond. But we should love them enough to give them the opportunity to explain why they're doing what they're doing. And if they are doing wrong, well, hopefully you'll do it in a spirit that will bring repentance. First Peter chapter 5 talks about the elders submitting to the younger and the younger to the elder. None of us in God's eyes is any better than the other. He is no respecter of persons. And when it comes to spiritual things, you know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. If, if one of us is blind because of our carnal nature. It doesn't have to be the pastor who, who addresses the problem, whoever sees the problem, who has the discernment to see it, is the one who has a responsibility. Not that I'm saying that they need to fulfill that responsibility by speaking to them, but, but they need to pray about it. Lord, what would you have me to do? 1 Corinthians 12 in talking about the spiritual gifts, says we're all different members of the same body. And what we think are the weaker members are the more needed members. Our judgment doesn't apply as to what is important and what isn't. We may see some person come in that their social status doesn't look too good. We think, well, I don't want to associate with them. But if the Holy Spirit is bringing them here, shouldn't we count them as a brother? Especially those of the household of faith. I remember some of the people from the jail ministry who visited here maybe one, once or twice, and I haven't seen them again. How were they treated? Hospitality is always an appropriate uh, Response. In Matthew 18, verse 7, Jesus says, Offenses will come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. We may be wrapped up in our own problems. We may come to church to be fed. But is that the primary reason we should be here? Shouldn't we be here to worship God and to be a blessing for others? And isn't the Sabbath so that we can lay our cares of the world aside for a while and rest in Him? And what better way than to share with someone else, someone who looks like they may need it?
First Peter chapter three. Verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And in, uh, in readings of the Spirit of Prophecy, I've read a reference in here. I, I w- wanted to look it up this morning, but my wife has already packed the books. So let me just refer to it. (laughs) Sister White says that that meekness and fear is not a fear for our own safety, but a fear that, but a fear that we may offend someone or not express the truth in a way which will be winning to them. And so, if we have something to say, we need to pray about how we're going to say it. We need to be. We need to consider the other person's situation. And a lot of times we don't know their situation. We don't know the burdens they carry. We may see someone doing something wrong and if you were to inquire, you might find out that they had so much more serious things on their mind that their whole life is just kind of falling apart a little bit around the edges. And uh, speaking to them about the little things is just like adding another brick to the to the pile that's being piled on their back. Romans 12. Favorite old text, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not your mind, but Christ's mind. Let it be the mind of Christ in you, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good, if you lay your yourself aside and do what's right because it is right, then you can experience and you'll know for yourself that God is good. Yes. And what he says to do is right. Paul speaks about that self quite extensively. And we're told that the carnal man cannot please God. What is the carnal man? That's doing what comes natural. Dwelling on the feelings that rise up in your heart when things happen. And if we give in to those feelings and let them be the rule of our life, we're a carnal man or a carnal woman. But to follow the Spirit, we've got to follow that Spirit that is expressed in God's love and His loving restrictions. Jesus said it very well in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If any man will follow me, let him deny himself. Crucify himself daily. And so, those natural feelings that arise in our heart, that's where the battle is for us. Ephesians 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The problems, our enemy, is not the people out there who are bringing problems to us. It's in our own heart. How are we responding to this? If they're doing something wrong, well, what's motivating them? What's in the high place of their mind? What do they give credence to that isn't right? 
That's what needs to be dealt with. In Isaiah 41, verse 13, is one of those precious promises. We don't have to go through this alone. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. But if we're dwelling on our own feelings and responding out of that, we're not grabbing a hold with a hand of faith, grabbing a hold of that hand that's ready there for us, to help us. God can be everything to us that we need. He'll take us by the hand and lead us through the darkness. But we've got to be willing to die to our selfish nature first. That's where the Christian battle is really fought, in our own hearts. Because all the knowledge about the Bible and the prophecies and everything won't do us any good if we aren't living God's love in our own heart. And when we're dwelling on our selfish desires and angers and petty grievances, the Holy Spirit isn't in that. And praise the Lord for the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who turn to Him and are willing to obey Him. He'll give us that Holy Spirit without measure if we'll follow Him without commit, without reservation. And the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit isn't given until it's needed. And if you want to see God's power in your life, then do something for Him. Put yourself in a place where that power is needed. In the time that I've been here, I've been on ten mission trips. In every one, I've seen a miracle of one kind or another, at least one. And some of them, only God could have done it. No other way. And so if you want to see God's hand work, you work. God is good. I have tasted. He is faithful. He has promised to provide. I've seen Him provide. And many here are saying amen. They've seen it too. And it's time to close the sermon. And I've got one more time to speak in two weeks. But next time it won't be my sermon. One of the uh, pioneers of the Advent movement, uh, Charles Fitch by name, in defending his faith, uh, wrote some responses to the elders of his church who were questioning why he was preaching what he was preaching. And he was preaching that we should lay aside all sin and, and live a righteous life. And he gave his response, which was right from his heart. And so in two weeks, I'll be sharing some of what he wrote and showing the heart of someone who is fully committed to the Lord and is trying to live right with him. Charles Fitch died nine days before the great disappointment. We're told that he was laid to rest to save him. He was so strong for the Lord, the disappointment would have been too much.